Okay, here we go. Part two of medication administration. I promise I'll go faster. This is going to last all day otherwise, isn't it? Um, parts of an order. Okay, first, patient's name, date and time, name of the drug, dosage, route, frequency, and a signature, actual or digital signature. Patient's name. You guys, there's going to be more than one Joe Jones on your unit. Sometimes. Okay, I've seen some pretty bad mess ups because people were just going by the name. So the information on the chart needs to be the patient's name along with that account number and so on and so forth. All those things you learn about Miss Demas that you have to check. Um, what will be on the actual doctor's order will be the doctor, the patient's name and their date of birth and their um, medical record number and their account number. There has to be a date and a time on every order. The name of the medication, it may be brand name, it may be generic. You're going to have to know how to look them up to tell which one it is, okay? Um, a lot of times the hospitals will, will only use generic names on their medication records. So sometimes the physician will write the order as a trade name and it will come up on the medication order as a generic name. You have to know how to deal with that. Okay? You have to know how to look it up and say, well gosh, okay, I see that I've got this medication generic name. I'm not sure what that is. And then I've got this on thing on the doctor's orders that's that says, you know, a, a brand name. Common sense says look it up and see if those are one and the same. Okay. There has to be a dosage. There has to be a route. There has to be a frequency, which is how often you give it. And it has to be signed either digitally if it's a computer order entry or actually if it's a doctor's order. You don't look at the doctor's order sheet, see a written doctor's order with no name on it, whoever wrote it, and, and you know, transcribe it onto your medication record and so on and so forth. The physician knows they're supposed to sign that order. If they didn't, they may not be finished with their orders. So you need to follow up with that. Okay. So when should you check, should, when should you question an order? Well, if you look at page 764 in your tailor, it says questioning a medication order. If in doubt, ask. Okay. Trust me, the physician, even though it may irritate people, the physician would rather you ask them than give a medication that you thought looked weird but you were afraid to ask. So be sure you ask somebody, okay? If there's an order in any of the required parts of the order, if you don't have a route, don't just assume a route. You have to have an order for a route. Don't just assume a dosage. You have to have an order for a particular dosage. Even if it's just one tablet, sometimes there's only one milligrams that that particular medication comes in. But you need to have some sort of a quantified dose that you're supposed to give, okay? Um, and so on and so forth. Allergies. If there is, if somebody is allergic to penicillin and they have a cephalosporin in or in antibiotic ordered, for instance, there are cross sensitivities with that. Typically, the pharmacy will catch that, but that may be something that you need to follow up with the pharmacy and follow up with the physician about if nobody seems to have caught that. Drug interactions. You've got somebody that's on um, Tylenol every six hours, and they also are on Lortab which is a hydrocodone slash Tylenol mix, that's, an, a question, that's when you need to question the order. You, probably you're going to give either or. Probably you're not going to be given both. If the order is difficult to read, don't just assume that you know what it says. Don't let the physician say, oh, well, you know what I write. That's not good enough. They're supposed to write it where you can see it, okay? If you d can't give a medication because you have concerns about it, it may be that a blood pressure medicine is ordered and the patient's blood pressure is too low that to safely give it in your nursing judgment. Or for some other reason, or you, you, the patient says, no, I'm not going to take that because I'm allergic to that, or so on and so forth. You don't just not give it. You hold it and you notify the physician or the person that prescribed it that you held the medication. It is out of your scope of practice to prescribe medicines. Unprescribing medicines is the same thing as prescribing medicines. It's out of your scope of practice to say this person should not be on this medicine. However, you can hold it and notify the physician. You document that you hold it, you document why you hold it, and you document that you notify the prescriber. Okay? Um, 
And this is all the stuff I just said. Sorry. Your son is failing first grade because his handwriting is totally illegible. So you're saying my son has what it takes to be a doctor. Yay! The beauty of all of this for you guys is computer physician order entry. You guys are coming into a new world where you're not as much going to have to deal with physician handwriting. And that is wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Okay. So what can cause a medication error? This order says terbutaline 0.5 milligrams now subcutaneously is what this, this says. Okay. However, if the line below it had some sort of scribble, 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 and that little decimal point right there got obscured, like maybe somebody thought it was the dot on an I below it, or maybe something came up and that would turn into terbutaline 5 milligrams now, sub so cute. Big difference in the dose there. 0.5 and 5 are huge differences in the dose. Okay, So, how you would solve this is always use a leading zero. Always write this terbutaline 0 0.5 milligrams because if that little decimal point right there gets obscured by something, drops off somehow, we miss it seeing it somehow, you're going to have 0, 0.5 milligrams. Well, that doesn't make any sense just to have 0, 0.5 milligrams written on there. So you always use a leading zero. Now the flip side of that is if this were 5 milligrams, if it really were 5 milligrams, you wouldn't put 5.0 because then if you lost your decimal point, it would turn into 50 milligrams and that might not catch your eye. So the rule is always use a leading zero, 0 0.5. Never use a trailing zero, which is 5.0. When you take a test in Canvas, you will be held to that standard. You don't put 0 0.5. If your answer is 0 0.5, you don't put 0.5, you put 0 0.5. You need to 100% of the time in your life use a leading zero, okay? So you will get it wrong because Canvas only understands 0 0.5. It doesn't understand 0.5, okay? So you'll get, the, you'll get the question wrong. And if you come to us and you say, but I did the math right, I just put it on there wrong. Well, what are we going to say? What are the rules? The rules are you always use a leading zero, okay? So always use a leading zero. Never use a trailing zero. Now, when you type 5 into your answer, if that's the answer, Canvas may put 5.0 on there. We know that. Don't worry about it. You just make sure that you type it in like you're supposed to type it in. This says Coumadin, 4 milligrams POQ day, I guess, which is every day. But I'm guessing, I don't know, this might be uh I don't know, something, I don't know what that is, 4 milligrams PRN chest pain. I don't know. So just make sure that if in this situation, if you don't know what that is, you get that clarified, okay? This label is in Braille. This person is blind. Lydia is blind, so she has her label in Braille. So just be aware of that. If you're sending a blind person home and their labels are not in Braille, that can be a problem. This is what you call miscommunication right here, okay? I will tell you, and this, I don't know really what the exact numbers are, but it's way on up there. In my mind, I bet 99% of the problems in this world are caused by miscommunication. If you think about your life and the issues that you have in your life sometimes, a lot of it is you just miscommunicated. You miscommunicated with your spouse, your significant other, your teacher. You just didn't understand something. Something just didn't get communicated right. In the hospital, it's the same way. There are so many errors in the hospital. They're caused by miscommunication. And documentation is part of communication. Okay? Being able to document and document appropriately is part of communication. Always use leading zeros, never trailing zeros. If the handwriting is not legible, clarify. If the label can't be read, that's dangerous, okay? What else can cause a medication error? Well, um, this person, let's see, this medication says Meprobium 8, 
400 milligrams 1PO QID. This means this medication, 400 milligrams, one tablet by mouth, four times a day. Um, Lantus, 80 units. I think that's supposed to be sub Q daily with supper. Enteric coated aspirin, 81 milligrams, one by mouth daily. Okay. So some of these abbreviations um, could be misconstrued. Okay. That QID should be written four times a day because somebody could look at that and think it means QD. Okay. Um, this units needs to be written out more. 80 units needs to be always written out where you can read it because that could be misconstrued. Okay. So there are some things on here that could be, this QID could be mistaken for QD. Do you see that this one's a little more obvious, that QID is a little more obvious. This is supposed to be QID also, but you could mistake that for Flomax 0.4 milligrams PO QID or QD. Somebody will say, well, that was a D and that's just, that D just disconnected there. So once again, just be aware that these could be potential for communicate miscommunication and you need to get it clarified if you don't understand it. What else can call medication? problems. Okay, if you don't understand that Viagra, which is sildenafil, this is a medication for erectile dysfunction, and I use this a lot just because the picture's out there. I don't, I don't, I'm not obsessed with Viagra, but, um, but Viagra has a very, very potent um, vasodilation effect. We know that because that's how it works, right? Um, that also can lower your blood pressure. If you have somebody that comes in that is having chest pain and you give them a nitroglycerin, which also lowers their blood pressure for their chest pain, and they have taken Viagra, they can die. Okay, they can die. It is, they will develop a, a hypotension that is very difficult to pull them out of, a low blood pressure that's very difficult to pull them out of. That is something you as a nurse should know. You should know, this is a male, I need to ask him, are you taking anything for erectile dysfunction before you give him a nitrate? You tell him, if you are, this, you cannot take this nitroglycerin I'm about to give you, so you need to tell me, okay? So that's just an example of when you as the nurse need to know what you're giving. You need to know, have the information you need on that medication. Sometimes you can get medications confused based on the spelling of the medication. So if you look at this, um, this list, it's called the sound alike, look alike, or look alike, sound alike drug list. When you're looking at the medication record, when you're looking at your actual MAR or the choices for the doctors to choose medicines or whatever, and in the computer, you'll see that they have the letters that are different from another drug that might be confused with it in capital letter, letters, like acetazolamide and acetahexamide. You might confuse those two, so you'll see a piece of the word capitalized. Bupropion and buspirone you might get those two confused. So you'll see a piece of the word capitalized. And what's capitalized is what's different. Chloropromazine, chloropromamide. Your eyeball looks at that and goes, yeah, something's not right about that. These people don't know how to capitalize. But what that's telling you is careful, you know, red flag, red flag, red flag. This is a drug that's, that's got a sound alike, look alike, another kind of drug that is not the same thing. Okay, and I've seen some bad mistakes done with that too. Sometimes the actual the pharmacy, I've seen the pharmacy feel the picks is wrong. It's not always just the nurse. Uh, the nurse, I've seen nurses do a sound alike, look alike mistakes, and I've seen pharmacies do. So you just have to be aware of that. Okay, it's very important that you know what medicine you're giving, and you look very carefully at the spelling. Okay, types of medication errors, inappropriate prescribing of a drug meaning something about the communication is wrong or it's a medication that was not right for that patient. Extra doses, omitted doses, wrong doses. 
If you find out that you have given a wrong dose, you've omitted a dose, you uh, gave them an extra dose, you need to follow up on that. Just don't ignore it. Okay? You need to follow up on that. Um, administration of the drug to the wrong patient. There are some real horror stories out there about giving medications to the wrong patient, giving it by the wrong route, giving it too fast or too slow, especially if it's a um, IV drug. Failure to give the medication within this prescribed time. If it's ordered for 10 o'clock in the morning and you don't give it till 2 o'clock in the afternoon, you've messed up your messed up your uh, blood levels. In a incorrect preparation of the drug, if it's supposed to be diluted out with something and you dilute it out with too much or too little, then you affect the delivery of the drug. Improper technique when administering the drug. We'll talk about parenteral medications and administering parenteral medications. You have to give the drug correctly to get it into the tissue so it can be absorbed correctly. If you don't give it right, then you're not going to have the, the right effect. Or giving a drug that's deteriorated, that's why we look at expiration dates on the drugs. You want to make sure that they're not expired. If you make a medication error, you need to check the patient to make sure that they don't have an adverse effect. You need to notify the nurse manager or the primary care provider you need to write a description of the error and the remedial steps taken on the medication record and you need to complete the form used for reporting errors as dictated by the facility policy. Okay, These are typically called incident reports or something else to that effect. Reporting a medication error on an incident report typically um, should not get you fired. Okay, it, it's it, Otherwise it, people wouldn't report themselves. <laughs> The medication errors that are made in the hospital, if you're a nurse and you make a medication error, it's not because you're not trained. You're trained, you went to nursing school, you passed your NCLEX, you are trained by the hospital in that particular unit. You know how to use the equipment, you know how to read the medication record. You are a trained person that is qualified to give that medication. If you still made a medication error, there's a reason, some kind of a reason. Either it wasn't put in the Pixis right, it wasn't ordered correctly on the medication record, it was you were just too darn busy, you didn't have enough help on the floor. Um, there's some reason that you made a medication error. I'm not saying we're making excuses for you. You have responsibilities for that and you will be held responsible, but it doesn't need to happen again. And so most, in my experience, most hospitals will not treat an incident report like you're going to get fired. What they'll do is they'll do what they call a root cause analysis and they'll try to figure out how you as an educated person who does all the right things and knows all the right things to do and was hired by the hospital because they believe you're qualified made this medication error. They're going to look and see what happened. It's called a root cause analysis. What happened? Because we need to prevent it from happening again. Okay. So, with regard to preventing medication errors, um, we need to know this, the, the rights. Okay, This particular PowerPoint has six rights. The book has eight rights. The pharmacology book has ten rights. You just need to know, I know, for, certainly know the first six rights, but just you just need to know the concepts that go along with those six rights, okay? Or all the rights, okay? First one being the right drug. Next one being the right patient. Next one being the right dose. Next one being the right route. Fifth is the right time and the right documentation. Okay. Um, your Taylor book also has the right reason, the right assessment data, the right education, the right documentation, and the right response. Some, some books will say the right to refuse. So you can get really hung up on all the rights, but what you really need to know is that you're doing all the right things for the patient. Okay, so there's your right reason, your right assessment, your right response, the right education, the right to refuse, the right documentation, so on and so on and so forth. Okay, there are three checks when you're given medications. When you're in the sim lab, we'll hold you to do these three checks. When you're in the clinical area, given patient medications, we'll hold you to do in these three checks. You check the medications when you first pull it. When you're pulling it out, you'll either have the doctor's orders and the chart right there, or you'll have your computer. There's, you know, your computer that says 
what is ordered and you'll have your pixels you're pulling it from. You'll need to be comparing those to make sure that you pull. That's your check number one when you pull the medications. Check number two, set them aside on the counter and say, okay, now I'm going to recheck my medicines. Because let me tell you, I'll be pulling your medicines out if you're in my clinical group. And it's entirely possible I pull not enough or too many or something, something, something. So, or skip one or whatever. So the second check is um, on the counter, in the medication room or wherever you're doing your thing while you're preparing your doses. That's where you're going to draw up your doses and, and so on and so forth. But that's your second check. Third check is at bedside before you give it, when you're actually going to give it and discard it, okay? That is your third check before you give it. Many times that also involves scanning it, okay? This is the person's first check. See her medication record is on, actually on her computer there, and that's the way it is at the hospital. The actual MAR is actually pulled up and connected with Cerner. So what you're pulling is actually, you know, you're actually seeing your Cerner chart in front of you. Um, you know, what's ordered in the Cerner chart in front of you because the Pixis. So she's looking at her Pixis and then when she opens the drawer, she'll pull the medication out. She'll look at the medication and she'll look at her medication record on the Pixis and make sure she's pulling the right thing. Okay. That's check number one. This is check number two. Now we're at bedside. I mean, we're at, at on the side of the Pixis. We're on the counter and say this is a nursing student and her instructor has pulled her medications for her doing the first check together. Now she's doing her second check. She's like, okay, well this is what I've got ordered on my medication record right here and this is what we pull. Let me make sure that this is the right thing. And then this is the third check. This is her looking at her medication record, comparing the bracelet um, and comparing the medicines to the medication record. Okay. Ask the patient about allergies. Always look at your expiration dates, and I'll tell you the ones we have here in the in the in the skills lab are real expired. Um, if it's unclear what it is, if you don't know what the expiration date is, if you don't understand what the name of it is, just don't give it. Okay. You have to have two patient identifiers. The patient, and I know Ms. Damas talked about this. So I'll go over this quickly, but typically identifiers are going to be the name and the date of birth some and you you look at the bracelet for that in long-term care facilities sometimes it's the name and facial recognition of a picture so but there is some way to identify the patient you need to know what that institution uses as the two identifiers um, but you need to have be able to document that you identified the patient by two different identifiers at the hospital we use the name and um, and the date of birth when we go in and give the medicines. Every time you go in to do something, you go in and say, can you tell me your name and your date of birth? The patient will roll his eyes the third time you do it, and the fifth time you do it, he'll laugh, and the tenth time you do it, he'll start making up stuff like Ronald McDonald or something. But you need to, because they will tell us if you don't do it every single time, I promise you the, the patient will tell us. Go in, hi, Mr. So-and-so, I need to give your medicines. Can you give me your, your full name and your date of birth? This is scanning. Even if you ask the name and date of birth, you still have to scan, okay? You have to match what the patient says to his bracelet and what the bracelet says to the medical record. Never, the patient can have the wrong bracelet on you guys, okay? It's entirely possible. So you have to ask them if they can tell you. If they can't tell you, obviously they can't tell you. But if they can tell you, you look at what he says, compare it to the bracelet, compare that to the medical record. Never use the bed number or the room number. Sometimes these people, especially in these rooms that have two people in them, some little old lady is sitting next to the window and says, this sign's too hot. And the other little old lady says, well, why don't you take my bed and let me go sit right and look out the window for a little while. They don't know that you're giving their medications in a minute and you may come in and give them to the wrong patient. Okay? So, this is, um, this is a scan. On a, on a medication when you're scanning the medicines, but you still, not only do you scan it, you still need to look at the name of the medication before you give it, okay? The right name. You need to know the generic name for medications. Typically, the generic name starts with a lowercase letter, and then if there is a trade name, the trade name is in parentheses with starting with an uppercase letter. So like you'll see acetaminophen 
all lowercase, and then in parentheses you'll see Tylenol with an uppercase T because that is the trade name. Tylenol is the trade name. Okay. Um, NCLEX uses generic names, so you need to know generic names. Drugs only have one generic name, but they have a lot of trade names. Ibuprofen is Advil, it's Motrin, it's so on and so forth. Acetaminophen is Tylenol, it is this Walgreens regular strength pain reliever. But it will always be, every acetaminophen will always be acetaminophen from box to box to box. It may have different names on it. Ibuprofen will always be ibuprofen from box to box to box, even though it has different trade names on it. So that's why we use generic names. Many companies manufacture the same drug using different names. Um, so that's why you need to know the generic name. The trademark names have like an R next to them, or they'll have TM written next to them. That's the trademark names. But the generic names will be lowercase, and they will be... Um, they will be if they're if they're written out in a sentence or whatever. So, but this one, sildenafil is the generic name. Viagra is the trade name. Okay. And this one, Advil, Motrin, Ibuprofen. Ibuprofen is the generic name. Motrin, Advil are trade names. Okay. There is also a chemical name. Sometimes you can take the chemical name and turn it into the generic name <laughs> with some abbreviations and whatever. But the chemical name is not something we have to mess with. This is something, you know, pharmacists and people that work with, with um, you know, chemists that work with medications obviously know the chemical names. That's not something we need to know. Just the generic, generic, and the brand name. This one is Olanzapine Tablets. And the trade name is Zyprexa, and that is the big, the tall man lettering right there. And I know you're saying, but look, that's capitalized. That's just because of how that's just because of how it is on the label. It's not um, always going to be capitalized, but the trade name is always going to be capitalized. Okay. Okay. So that's the generic name, the trade name, and who manufactured it. Okay. Avidard is the trade name. This Dutazuride is the Generic name. Okay. Um, that is the NDC number. Don't worry about that. That's not something. It's called the National Drug Code. It's just a, it's a, a code that's um, unique to that drug. Um, and that's not something that we really necessarily have to do anything about. However, when you scan it, of course, that's what it's scanning. But that's not something that you have to certainly memorize or be able to identify. So. This one's trademarked Avidart. The right dosage, you need to be able to identify the dosage. The dosage of this is 0 0.5 milligrams per tablet. All right, y'all can see that. Glucophage, this is, there's 500 tablets in the bottle and they are 500 milligrams a piece. Glucophage is the trade name. Metformin hydrochloride is the, is the generic name. This is Glucotrol. There's 500 tablets in this particular container. Glucotrol is the trade name. Glipizide is the generic name. Five milligrams per tablet. Kalen SR. Kalen SR is the trade name. Verapamil hydrochloride is the generic name. 240 milligrams is per tablet. Sustained release means that this is enteric coated. Enteric coated means it will release slowly because of some different coatings that are on it. So this is not a medication that you could cut it or grind it up because then you would undo the effect of it being sustained release. So this is SR means sustained release. Sometimes it'll say XL for extra long. There's different ways they abbreviate that. So. 100 capsules in this particular container. Procardia is the trade name. Nifedipine is the generic name. 10 milligrams is the dose. Sometimes it's not in a big container. Sometimes it's in a unit dose package, particularly in the hospital. They're usually in unit dose packages. Um, and this will have the medications information on the back of the package and then each little pill has its own blister pack. And you'll see that a lot in um, 
especially in long-term care, okay? But you just still, once again, need to make sure that you check the name on the back and the dosage with what's in the Pixis or whatever your situation is. This is also a unit dose pack. This is, um, this is a medication that's a liquid. And there's 30 mils in here. If you only ordered, if you only had 15 mils ordered, then what you would need to do is pour out the 15 mils into a container that you were giving and waste the rest of it, okay? They must be administered by the route that the physician ordered. This one's PO, this one's sub Q, this one's PO, subcutaneously, this is PO. Needs to be, don't just decide, well, the patient's sleeping and I don't want to give them a pill, so I'm just going to grind it up and give it IV or something, which obviously would kill them. But you, you need to give the route the way it's ordered, okay? Order medications are given, P, are called PO. Oral medications are by mouth or PO. That's called per os. Um, it can be solid or it can be liquid. These are solid. Forms, capsules, caplets, gel tabs, score tablets, score, you know, score caplets, enteric coated tablets. Once again, the enteric coated means that it, the, the coating will dissolve off slowly, especially things like aspirin that, that are bad for your stomach, that are difficult on your stomach. They cause gastritis. They may have a coating where they won't actually dissolve in the stomach. They actually dissolve further down, okay? Because aspirin is a real weak acid and it will dissolve in your stomach very readily. So they use enteric coated so it won't do that, okay? Tablets that are scored may be broken in half. Um, sometimes you'll have something ordered that be broken in half that's not scored, but if it's scored, you know it can be broken in half. It's not enteric coated. Enteric coated, once again, never to be chewed or crushed or cut in half. Buccal means it goes in your, um, the mucosa of your mouth. Sublingual means it goes under the tongue, but not swallowed. Okay. A capsule contains powder, liquid, or granules in a little gelatin case. Y'all have seen these. You can actually sometimes open those little capsules and pour the medicine out from the inside. You need to be sure, though, if it's a sustained release or an extra long release, extended release, you need to make sure that you've talked to the pharmacy and ask them, say, I've got a patient that I, want, I need to give this in their applesauce. Can I open this capsule and actually give it, or do I need to not do that? Because sometimes the sustained release is the actual capsule itself. Sometimes the little tiny granules inside it are actually coated for sustained release, in which case you can, always, you can open it up and give it. Okay, so we'll talk about that in the lab. Okay. Elixirs is a medication that's in an alcohol solution. Obviously, there's some people that wouldn't get that. If somebody has got liver issues and they can't tolerate alcohol, then maybe they don't need an elixir. Maybe they need a syrup. It's a medication that's dissolved in sugar and water. If somebody's diabetic, then their blood sugar is out of whack. They may not need a syrup. They may need an elixir. So you just have to make sure that you understand what is, um, what is, is the, the vehicle that the medicine is carried in. A suspension is, is um, something that's dissolved in a liquid. A lot of times you'll have to shake them up. Those of y'all that have children that have given that little pink bubblegum medicine, you know, they send it home in a powder and you put water in it and you mix it up. You have to make sure and shake that up. So, This is liquid medication in a cup. You can see that's five milliliters of liquid medication. We'll practice this in the lab. You can, and we'll, we'll practice this in the lab too. You can see that this medication is, this is one mil, this is two mils, this is two and four tenths of a mil, and we'll look at those in the lab. So, okay, this is buccal. This is between the cheek and the, and the teeth. This is sublingual. This is under the tongue. It dissolves under the tongue. Parenteral, and I have some more conversation that we'll have about that. We'll talk some more about that. But parenteral medications are, are basically the shots. They're given in a sterile technique, and then they're injected into the body. Okay. It can be epidural, which means it goes into your epidural space. That's not something you'll be doing. That's something the anesthesia people do and are the physician. You know, if you go to CRNA school, you'll learn to do epidurals. Um, the intramuscular, that is something that we'll teach you to do. You just need to make sure that you know exactly what the technique is for that. It's very important that you do it right, make it sure it absorbs right, and make sure you don't cause any problems, but that's intram intramuscular. Subcutaneously, we'll teach you to do that. That is 
insulins and some blood thinners and things like that. They're given in the subcutaneous tissue, which is the fatty tissue under the skin. It's given in a, with a shorter needle and a smaller syringe. And intravenously, you won't learn about IV drugs this semester. That'll be next semester, but certainly you'll be able to give those when you get out and start practicing. Intradermal is like your PPD test that you guys have had. It's just beneath the skin. Intracardiac is into the cardiac muscle. That's that exciting shot they give on TV when they need to resuscitate somebody, so they put they, a needle of epinephrine or whatever straight into their heart. You'll see that in the emergency department. Um, we won't be given any of that this semester. <laughs> Hopefully, you won't, your patient won't have to have that ever. But an intrathecal is also into the spinal column. It's into the space under the arachnoid membrane, and that's not something that you at this at this point we're going to be doing either. So. Okay, I'm going to stop at this point and restart on part three with the topical medications.